felt like I wanted to be a little closer to you. So here I am, and here you are. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer, please. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us during these moments of meditation on your word. Take the hopes, the dreams, the meditations, the questions of all of our hearts and the imperfect words of my mouth and lead us once again to that place where we know who and whose we are. All this we ask in the name of our Savior and brother, Jesus the Christ, who calls us his very own and makes us one. Amen. 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 Beloveds in Christ, over the last few weeks with, I'm going to say the word COVID, rates rising again in Connecticut, maybe you've seen what I've seen. More people taking on some of those practices that we first began in 2020 and 2021, you know, wearing masks in public places like the grocery store, planning outdoor instead of indoor activities and gatherings, canceling appointments when they discover that they've been exposed to someone with COVID, checking online sources to discover when the next booster is coming. I'm beginning to wonder if some people will start up with some of those same hobbies that they began in COVID, you know, bread baking, knitting, watercolors, yoga. To be honest, I will say I dabbled in some of those. I tried to read all 16 books in Louise Penny's Armand Gamache series, but I only got to book three. But I did develop a habit which actually has, if I'm honest, and if you can't be honest in the church, where else can you be honest, right? If I'm honest, one of the obsessions I developed was a television series, a little television series entitled Ted Lasso. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, all my Ted Lasso fans, beautiful. It's a, shown, uh, it's a series shown on Apple TV, and while I hope over the next several minutes you will see how this TV series and Coach Lasso has a surprising connection to our scripture, and even maybe to our life of faith. Let me begin with this caveat. Ted Lasso has many positive and encouraging messages. It also contains some language and references that may be objectionable to some and which cannot be repeated in the sanctuary. I am not gonna talk about any of those this morning, but please take note viewer discretion is advised. I don't want anybody going to home and saying, I gotta watch Ted Lasso, and then they watch it and they're like, what was that minister talking about? But here is a simple plot of the show. Those of you who have seen it could probably tell this to us as well. Ted Lasso is a mildly successful American football coach from a small college in Kansas. He gets tapped to coach a story yet struggling British football team, also known as a soccer team, in the Premier League in England. The reality, Ted knows almost nothing about soccer. Ted knows almost nothing about England. But Ted does know something about being positive and optimistic and coaching others. Ted has an obsession it's not on winning, his obsession is about playing, and specifically a certain type of playing. Playing well, but more importantly, playing as a team, and then knowing the joy, the sheer joy, that comes from that kind of playing. Well, friends, our coach Lasso may not be concerned about winning, but it appears that many others are. His focus as playing on a team often brings rancor and ridicule from others. He's considered a loser and an outsider, and at every turn, there are people all around him who aren't afraid to tell him just that. 
This theme builds up over the entire first season of the show until the final episode. Another viewer advisory, this sermon contains plot spoilers. <laughs> In the last episode, the team Ted coaches, who knows the name? AFC Richmond, thank you, is preparing for the last game of the season. It is a critical game against a very significant and a very, very much better rival. A loss has far-reaching implications for the team. Now I have to tell you, the chances of Richmond actually winning are minimal, but the fans, the reporters, and even some of the team members are acting as if the outcome is already determined. As he is confronted by folks in the local pub, it's set in England, there are a lot of scenes in a pub. Coach Lasso is actually surprised by their attitude. Hey, he says, you are acting as if you have already lost the game. Why don't you have a little hope? The fans look at Ted in disbelief disbelief, and they say to him, haven't you lived here long enough to know that it's the hope that kills you? <laughs> it's the hope that kills you. These words, one commentator writes, are the words of a downtrodden people and team, a phrase that speaks of hope deferred over and over and over again until it is no longer viable. Hope to a soccer fan is a disaster, a death sentence. You put all your hope into a win, and then when your team loses, you are crushed. Crushed. But here's the reality, friends, right? No one team not even the U.S. women's national soccer team or the Yukon women or men's team or, I just have to say this because I'm a Red Sox fan, the New York Yankees <laughs> win all the time, right? So see, it's the hope that kills you. Well, it appears our Coach Lasso will have nothing of this. He can handle multiple insults that come at him, he can handle outright ridicule, but he cannot bear watching people dismiss hope. He just can't do it. And in this way, Coach Lasso is very much like the Apostle Paul, isn't he? The Apostle, especially in the letter to the church at Rome that we hear today, exhorts the Christian community to remain steadfast in their hope. Paul knew only too well what it was like to be ridiculed, insulted, insulted. He knew imprisonment, crushing defeat, persecution, trials, and tribulation. And yet the apostle was obsessed with hope. Some have described him as a prisoner of hope. But despite all he faced, all that came to him, Paul could still write of hope, and he could still, most importantly, live in hope. Here is one way we might interpret what the Apostle Paul sells, says. It's not the hope that kills you, it's the hope that makes you live. It's the hope, friends, that makes us live, right? Why? Why could Paul speak of hope in the midst of what so many others found hopeless? For Paul, and I think it is true for us too, it is because God, our God, has placed a deep and abiding hope in all of creation and in all of us. Hope. Hope is in our DNA, in our minds, our souls, our spirit. Hope is in these very bodies, right? We are incarnational. We carry this hope in us, a hope that is alive, 
a hope that animates us, a hope that draws us together, a hope that is reflection of the divine in whose image we are all gloriously made. Two years ago, I was serving a bridge ministry at a church going through a time of transition in the already chaotic COVID time. During a staff meeting, we were discussing how, to, how do you move forward, right? How do you move forward in times of uncertainty and grieving? We wonder together, what is the effect of something we do or don't do on another person's life and faith? What type of worship and programs enable people to talk about and wrestle with and eventually embrace change? What are the consequences of each decision? What if we make a wrong decision? In the midst of our conversation, one of the staff members shared some wisdom that she learned from her eight-year-old sister, Emily. Emily faced a big challenge at school, and many others encouraged her, you're strong, you've got it, don't be afraid. But Emily told her sister, as people said to her, be brave, be brave. She said to her sister, you cannot be brave if you've never been afraid. I think the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing to us about hope. You cannot have hope. You cannot live in hope. You cannot bear and birth hope into the world if you've never been hopeless if you've never faced despair or doubt about yourself, about others, about faith, about the church, or even about God. And maybe, maybe that's what it means to live in the groaning times, as the Apostle says, to live in these groaning times, to face the pain of the world in ourselves and in others, and hold on at the same time to that hope that is our birthright and our way forward. And oh my friends, these are groaning times, aren't they? If we stop, when we stop and listen, I think we can hear creation groaning. We can hear ourselves groaning all around the planet we hear the groaning of rising temperatures and rivers and oceans drying up and forests and plains disappearing and storms becoming more severe and birds' song silenced and species disappearing. We can hear our hearts and our spirits groaning for ourselves and our beloved ones amid health and life challenges financial worries, relationship struggles, family divisions, and disruptions. We can hear the groaning of ongoing war and its devastation in far too many places. Gun violence that goes unabated. Homelessness increasing in this state, especially among older adults and senior citizens. Choices about our bodies and lives being restricted or even denied. The beloved creation and creatures of God, our human home and our human family, groan in pain and grief, longing for healing and wholeness, longing for, as the prophet Amos says, for justice to roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. But listening, listening to that suffering and sorrow in us and around us is just the first step on the way to hope. For the Apostle reminds us, hope hears not just the groaning, but also the song of glory. Hope sees not just the pain, but also glimpses the possibility. Hope touches not just the wound, but opens us up to the wonder 
found in healing and wholeness. In her latest book entitled Hope, a User's Manual, pastor and author Mary McKibben Dana writes about one of her personal heroes, Reverend Mitri Rahab, a Lutheran pastor she met in Bethlehem, Palestine. Reverend Rahab's entire life since the age of five has taken place under occupation, and even though he could leave the area, he has chosen to remain, faithfully laboring with his people and working for peace and freedom in Palestine. Here's what Reverend Rahab says about hope. Hope is wrapped up in what we make real. Hope isn't what we think, it isn't what we feel, it isn't even what we imagine is possible. Hope is what we do. Hope is what we do in the face of uncertainty and struggle and suffering. Hope is what we do in the face of pain and injustice. Hope is what we do even when the world tells us what we do doesn't matter. Amen? Hope is what we do. And so let's ask ourselves today, what can you and I do in the days ahead to embody this hope? Where are the wounds that need our tender touch? Who needs a listening ear or a place of welcome at the table? And where do some tables need to be turned over? so that the moral arc of the universe bends a little bit more towards justice. What kind of world do we want to build? What kind of church is God calling us to create? What can you and I do to bring hope to one another and to the world? So that everyone can know that it's not the hope that kills you but it is the hope that makes you live. Let me, oh, I'm not quite done yet, is it okay? <laughs> I got that obsession with Ted Lasso, I gotta give you the last scene, my friends. That last scene, Coach Lasso is delivering a speech to the team. They are gathered in the locker room after that game with so many consequences. The result, you see, is not what they had hoped for, and they are all carrying the weight and the despair of both the loss and the consequences. But Coach Lasso gives them some words of hope. There's nothing I can say to you right now that will take all your feelings away, he tells them. But do me a favor. Lift up your heads and take a look around you. Really lift up your heads and take a look around you. <laughs> look at the people in this circle. I want you to be grateful that you are going through this moment and this time with these other people. You see, for Ted and the team, and I would venture to say, for the Apostle Paul and for each of us and for the church, there is something worse than going through the time of grief and groaning, a time of uncertainty and transition, and that is going through such times alone. Coach Lasso reminds everyone in his undeniable Midwestern twang, there ain't nobody alone in this here. There ain't nobody alone in the church either, is there? So if you are here in this sanctuary, lift up your head and look around. If you are worshiping in line, think of the people in this community that remind you that you are not alone. Offer a prayer of gratitude to God for the people God has put into your life and for the power of the Spirit that has drawn you together. Hope flourishes in community, be it in a locker room, a sanctuary, the grocery store, 
the fellowship hall, wherever people come together. Hope is nourished and tended as the Apostle Paul reminds us with perseverance and eager anticipation. The church community is the place where we learn to see, not as things are, but as things might be, strengthening us with a hope that makes us live. May God's love make it so. May God's love make it soon for all of us. Alleluia. Amen.